All right, hello everybody. Um, happy Grad Student Appreciation Week and welcome to the Grad Alting Workshop Series. At today's session, we will answer the question, how do I negotiate my salary? So I'm happy to see um, so many folks joining us live today, as well as those who are going to view this on YouTube. Um, my name is Debbie McCutsky, and I am the coordinator of services and programs for graduate student legal aid, and I use she, her pronouns. Um, this workshop is being co-hosted by Graduate Student Legal Aid, Graduate Student Life, the Graduate School, the University Career Center, and the President's Promise. Um, this session is being recorded and automatic closed captioning has been enabled. So please be aware that you may experience errors related to accuracy, synchronicity, program completeness, and attribution. Um, so for those who have not attended a Grad Alting workshop yet, you may not know that this workshop series is just one service offered by Graduate Student Legal Aid. So our team provides a variety of services, including legal consultations that are done by our attorney and director, Zach Mundy, um, legal immigration consultations that occur once a month, advocacy consultations, um, where our grad students help students who have been charged by the university, and notary services. So for more information about our services, um, after the workshop, I'll send you an email with links to um, our website, as well as um, a lot of other information. So here's the plan for our workshop today. Post your questions in the chat and direct them to everyone. Um, the speaker will answer some questions during the presentation and others after the presentation. Um, near the end of the workshop, I'm gonna post a link to our six second survey. Literally, it takes six seconds. Um, we only ask a few questions and we really need your feedback. So please take the time to do that. And as I said before, later this afternoon, I will send you an email that contains um, a link to all of the materials um, from this workshop, including the recording, the registration link to next week's workshop and other information. So next up is my co-host, uh, Jennifer Enriquez. Jen is the coordinator for graduate student life, which means that she works to make UMD feel like home. So Jen, please tell us what you have planned for graduate student appreciation week. Hi everyone, uh, like she said, my name is Jennifer Enriquez. I use she, her pronouns. Um, so we have a lot going on for graduate student appreciation week. A lot of our ticketed or uh, events that require registration are sold out but there are still plenty of creative kits. If you're into crafting or anything like that, you could pick that up at uh, Studio A, but you just have to register first through our ticketing site, but you can find all links uh, relevant to Appreciation Week through the site that I just posted into the chat. So that's stamp.umd.edu slash GSAW. Um, other things coming up this week, we have game night um, on Thursday and grad terp exchange uh, following that. That's with the grad school. Show up and support your fellow grads um, as they present their findings and research. Um, there's also a dance lesson on Friday. So the, the three that I just mentioned are free and open, no registration required. And now I get to introduce my lovely colleague and friend, Dr. Susan Martin. Uh, she is the program director of professional and career development at the UMD Graduate School. She designs, implements, and delivers career and professional development services for PhD students and postdocs. These services are designed to enable Maryland PhDs and postdocs to step out in a highly successful career of their choice in academia, industry, nonprofits, or government. Make an appointment through a career for TERPs uh, with Dr. Martin to discuss your specific career exploration and search questions. More information about Dr. Martin's background is in her LinkedIn profile. Welcome, Dr. Martin. Well, thank you. Uh, it is such a 
pleasure to be here during Grad Student Appreciation Week. This is one of my favorite weeks of the year. I love working with graduate students. And uh, I'm so excited to be invited back to do the salary negotiations workshop. Uh, my presentation is actually about more than salary negotiations. We're actually gonna talk about how do you evaluate an offer. But before I start the formal presentation, I've dropped the link to the Google folder that's public and it has the presentation, it has the handouts that I'll be referring to today. So everything is right in that folder. But before we start, I wanna get a, a sense of who is in the room. And Debbie has uh, a poll, two poll questions that she's going to pop up. So let's put, um, put the poll questions up and, and let's, I wanna find out who's in the room and what kind of experiences you've had with um, accepting offers and evaluating offers. Debbie, you all set with those? Um, well, I did put the poll in and it's, um, I, it's not there. That's okay. No <laughs> worries. I'm so me... sorry. Okay. Well, you know what? We're, that is not an issue at all. So I noticed that a lot of folks have their cameras off. Uh, if you could type in the chat box, whether you, you know, you're a master's student or a doc student and what program you're in, and that'll be just perfect. Let's see who's here in the room. Not a problem. Put your master's or doctorate. Okay, first year, marketing, physics, PhD, excellent, applied economics, CS, great. Another CS student, super. Okay, staff member, welcome. I'm glad you're here. That's great. Okay, well, that gives me a sense who's here. It looks pretty split between doctors and master's, master's students. Hi, Aditya, nice to, thank you. You're a master's in communications, great. Okay, so now um, for my second question, if you could, if you've negotiated a salary before, could you raise your little mechanical Zoom hand? That is, well, it's not mechanical, but it's under, <laughs> <laughs> how do you like that? If you could go ahead and raise your hand, uh, if you've, and that is now under reactions. So if you click on reactions, I see one, two, okay, a couple of you, three, excellent, excellent. So three out of maybe 13. So not so many have negotiated. All right, so let me go ahead and I'm gonna move through some slides and we're a nice small group. Well, we're a big group, but a small group. So if you have questions, please type them in the chat box. And Debbie and or Jennifer, if you're asking a question about something that I'm talking about, they're gonna jump right in and ask the question. Okay, so as I, let me share my screen. As I mentioned, I am actually gonna talk about how do you evaluate offers and then how do you negotiate offers? Most people want to jump right into the notion of salary negotiation, but there are some things you need to think about ahead of time. So that's me. Uh, Jennifer did a great introduction already, so I won't say more, but April Fuller is my graduate assistant. And for those of you who are doctoral students, you may have already met April at some of her foundational workshops. I have a nice 14 minute overview that talks about the services for doctoral students but I don't want our master's students to feel left out. They're, you're in good hands. There are four different career centers on campus. If you're in the College of Engineering, I'm sure you've already interacted with uh, Veronica, my colleague, or um, Liza. The staff there works with all engineers, everyone from bachelor's to postdocs. In the Smith School, there's also an Office of Career Services in the School of Public Policy as well. And if you're not in engineering, business, or public policy, you're served by the University Career Center and the President's Promise. And you would make your appointment through Careers for Terps, if you're an engineer, through Careers for Engineers. And each of the other two schools also have their own career portals. So if you're not using career services already, I strongly encourage you to pop over to their websites and take a look at what kinds of other events that they have coming up. You don't have to read this now. Um, the reason I, I put the, these top 10 up here, this is all about the tools and the skills that you need to manage your career for life. 
And today, we are working on number nine. It's all about negotiating and accepting or declining offers. And the career centers that I mentioned on the previous slide can help you with all of these pieces of managing your career. So we are gonna talk about what you do when you get an offer. I'm gonna provide a method for you to evaluate offers. I'm gonna give you some things to think about. Then you're going to go, we're going to go over the basic steps of the salary negotiation process, and we'll do Q&A at the end and also here. So my first professional tip for you is that you want to deflect discussing salary until you actually have a job offer. So sometimes you might be, you might be asked about salary requirements. Um, I would encourage you if you can just fill in text like we'll discuss at an interview or if you get asked about it, that you use some of the phrases that I've got here. Um, let's see if I'm a good fit before we talk, start to talk about salary. Um, I hope and expect that my salary would actually line up with uh, the market rates in the region. And if you get asked more than once, never give one specific number. Please go ahead and uh, provide a range um, and and a, an open range, a wide range. And always quote that you've done some salary research ahead of time. So even if you don't already have a job offer, there are some things that you should do right now. And the first thing is you wanna think about what the most important thing for you is in your next position. And we're gonna do a quick activity in a moment uh, using one of the handouts that I have. But the other thing that you can do if you haven't done already is you can start doing some basic research about what the types of positions that you have applied for are paying so that you can um, be prepared to provide a salary range if you're really pressed. So doing your research now is something you, you can do and it should be part of your actual research about careers and jobs that you're planning to apply for. There's one last thing you can do as well, and that is to figure out your bottom line budget. And I'm, I'm going to name that in terms of when you graduate and are making a salary, it, it may be a very different scenario than what it is now. Um, so some of you may have some student loans that you're still paying on. You may be moving to a new geographic area and are going to need to uh, perhaps rent an apartment. Uh, your budget may look very different than it will uh, as, as it has as a graduate student. So these are some things, uh, understanding what your priorities are, doing some basic research right now about what different jobs pay, and then figuring out what your budget will be when you graduate. Those are things you can do right now. So I'm going to just pause for a minute and uh, ask Debbie and Jen, were there any questions that are related to what's been said so far? Not yet. Okay. All right. So one of the common questions I get all the time is, okay, I, I received a verbal offer either at the end of the day, like when you've gone back for a second interview, or uh, if you, second interviews, visits, company visits are happening online now. So at the end of a half day or a full day interview, you may be verbally offered the job, or you might get a phone call. So those verbal offers can happen in a variety of ways. And my, my first piece of advice is, of course, you're going to do your happy dance that you have a job offer. But my first piece of advice is do not accept on the spot. Ever, never, never accept on the spot. <clears throat> because you want to make sure that you understand the complete package, the complete compensation package. Oftentimes, an employer wants to make a verbal offer so that they can do the negotiation and generate that written contract, employment contract, or letter offer just one time. So they're trying to avoid paperwork on their part. Now, I will say there are some companies that will expect to do the negotiation at the end of the day. And if you've been doing your research about how different companies make offers, if you're leveraging your network, you may need to be somewhat prepared at the end of the day. Um, but in most cases, it's very normal for you to express excitement about the position 
and listen carefully to what the offer is. Write down what you're hearing. Make sure that you have all of the details. Take notes. And if it's by phone or even if it's in person, it's okay to say, let me make sure I've got this right. The salary is this. The start date is this. Um, you're telling me that I can learn more about the benefits package on your website. So it's, it's very typical for an employer to um, expect you to respond in two or three days. So 48 hours is pretty typical. If they don't give you a date by which they want you to respond, ask them, when would you like a response? Clarify, how would you like me to make the response? And if you need more time, it's okay to ask for it. So when you get that verbal offer at the end of an interview, make sure you've got all the facts down, ask if you'll be receiving that in writing and ask when they need a response by. If they tell you they need an answer right, right now, I think it's, that's, that should be a flag for you. Most employers know that you are going to want time to review the offer carefully, ask questions, and even discuss it at home, meaning with family, partner, friends, whatever. So it's okay to ask for more time. As a general rule, it's not okay to ask for more than a week because when you ask for more than a week, it can leave the impression that you're not really interested in that job with the employer who's made the offer. It's okay to be transparent and let them know, for example, that you have a number of applications out, you're, you're wrapping up your interview process and that you'd like an, at least another week to make sure that you honor those processes um, and, and see what they say. Okay, most employers are willing to give a week. Again, if you ask for more time, they, they start to feel like mm, you're not necessarily interested. So you're always going to express uh, gratitude for the offer, interest in the position. You're gonna make sure you've got the details and you're going to, going to request, if they don't tell you when they want a response, you're gonna clarify and you're going to say, I'd like some time to fully consider the offer. Okay, never respond on the spot. Okay, so we're gonna do a quick little activity to help you clarify your priorities. Um, so this will be something I'm going to show you. I'm gonna put in the chat box once again, the folder that has all the handouts just in case somebody joined us late. And the handout that we're going to look at is called Getting Clear on What You Want. And this handout actually comes, it was from, a, it's from a course. It's called, how to, it's uh, called um, Evaluating Your Job Offer by Christine DiDonato. All UMD students have free access to LinkedIn Learning. This course, I think, is an hour and 17 minutes. If you could all open up this handout, and I want you to look through this list of um, criteria. <clears throat> okay, so I want to collaborate. I want excitement. I want a flexible schedule. I want health care. Um, I want recognition. So look over this list. And I know for some of our international students, many of you are very interested in the opportunity for sponsorship. Okay, so um, I want you to look over this list and rate each of them, one as most important, two as somewhat important, and three as least important. <clears throat> and I'll give you a few minutes. I don't want you to overthink this. You can go ahead and rethink it later, but I want everyone to come up with at least two things that they must have. Two things that you must have. I'm gonna put that in the chat box. And then I want you to come up with one thing that you would walk away, that you would turn the offer down. So it's the thing that it, 
If you don't have that, you're not going to entertain the job. So I want you to come up with two must-haves and one, I, I'm going to call that your non-negotiable. It's the thing that if you, if it's not part of this position, you are going to walk away. It would prompt you to walk away. Okay, so I'm putting that in the chat box. Once you, I'm going to stop sharing. Once you have a chance to come up with your two must-haves and one non-negotiable, could you put, could you use the reaction again and just give a thumbs up or <clears throat> so that I can see that you're finished? I want to make sure that you all have time. Thanks, Varun. Thanks, Aditya. Oh, sorry, that's Ashley. Oh, I had to move my chat box. <laughs> <clears throat> thank you, thank you. Thanks, Aditya. Thanks, Lizzie. Judah, super. Give folks a few more minutes. Okay, so if, if I could hear just maybe from a couple of people about the two things you must have and the one thing that you would walk away from. I think that this is always interesting to hear what other people people view as the must-haves. Is there anyone who's willing to unmute themselves? And uh, you can turn your camera on or off, but if you're willing to share your two must-haves and the walk away. Anybody? Oh, thanks, Varun. I appreciate it. Hi, uh, Suzanne. Uh, good afternoon. So, uh, and thanks for the exercise. For me, two must-haves are a good work-life balance. And the second one is the salary, at least uh, uh, according to the standards of the, uh, in my job uh, market. And uh, one thing which is a walk away for me is traveling too much, like probably more than 30% of my time at the job. I would want to travel. I would want to avoid traveling. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Super. So those are the kinds of things that you should be finding out about and learning about through the interview process. Let's take one more person who maybe has something different. Oh, thank you, Aditya, yeah. for putting those in the chat box. Who's the other person? Hi, uh, Judah. Oh, hi, Judah. Thank you. Hey. Go ahead. Um, so my must have is authority, authority, ability to make decisions on fluent. Mm -hmm. and um, money and financial gain because I know here on earth it's very important <laughs> if you don't have much money <laughs> you really can't do much things but look out the window <laughs> that's super that's super and is there something that you'd walk away from that would be recognition right? um because I walk away from recognition because you don't always need recognition for things that you do you know it's more of a okay. spiritual thing to me so uh, I look to God for recognition. So I don't really need the recognition. I like to help people and, and, and watch them succeed. I mean, I'll, you know, if when, it, when it's my time, I'll succeed as well, so. Super, thank you so much. That's You're super. Welcome. So I, I am so appreciative of Judah and um, Varun for sharing that because I think you'll see that each person has the set of things that's really important to them and this can change over time. It can change over time. So as you're evaluating job offers that are coming your way, as you're leaving your graduate program, remember these priorities are for now. It doesn't have to be this way forever, but it's really important for you to have clarity about what you must have. And then you can clearly evaluate the job offers that come your way. And I can tell you, if you meet with any of the career center staff, we will, and you, and you have a job offer on the table, in some way, shape, or form, we will ask you about what's most important to you. And this little worksheet is a good way for you to think about what those priorities are. Okay, so we haven't even talked yet about negotiations, but this is really important. It's step one of evaluating a job offer. Okay, I am going to proceed along. I'm going to reshare my screen. 
Okay, let's go. I'm going to have you not push send yet, but I want you to in the chat box type what about negotiating your salary and compensation gives you anxiety. Let's let's see what gives you anxiety. And you can go ahead and push send. Okay, to have multiple offers in hand that gives you anxiety. That Okay, so for some people having multiple offers is it's a it's a good problem to have but it can be anxiety producing. Okay, for other people the the opposite. Okay, I've got this one opportunity. What if I don't take it? I may not get anything. If I negotiate, they'll think I'm ungrateful. Okay, being afraid that they'll pull back an offer. Great. Losing a position because of salary. All right. Great, great, great. All right. So these are these are some these are some problems and things that make people nervous. Uh, I'm going to address a few of these. Um, first of all, I'm going to share with you. Let me just pop all of these up at once and you can read through. Oops, let me go back. So the reality is, is that people are nervous about negotiating and there are gender differences. There are generational differences. Uh, as you can see, women and other underrepresented or marginalized groups oftentimes feel like if they negotiate, they might lose the job offer. Um, quite honestly, that's not true. In fact, I want to show you um, what salary.com found out that employers, 80% of them are not upset or offended when job seekers negotiate. In fact, they're expecting people to ask for more and down the pike, um, they expect employees to ask for a raise. Okay, so oftentimes as a new graduate, a new graduate of the university, individuals don't necessarily have experience doing salary negotiation and they think that it's wrong to do it or they don't feel worthy of doing it. And I hope that you leave today's presentation with the information that this is normal this is as normal as applying for jobs. And it's a skill, just like learning how to create a resume and effectively interview, learning how to negotiate different aspects of your compensation is something that you can learn. And there are lots of resources out there to help you. It just takes practice. So sal starting salary matters. <clears throat> it matters because future raises are based on this starting salary. And in fact, um, salaries are usually evaluated once a year around performance appraisal time. So if you don't negotiate it up front, it will not be revisited for a whole year. And then each year, it's going to be based on a percentage of what that salary, starting salary was. So one of the things that I want you to keep in mind is that um, even when other variables are controlled for, so women who are working full time are being paid less for a variety of reasons. And one of them is that they do not negotiate as frequently as men. So now this just doesn't penalize women. It penalizes whole families, right? Because equal pay is really a family issue. And I'm sure that those of you who are in partnerships running a household, you would like it if your partner was able to earn a wage that was worthy of the work that they are doing. So this is an equity issue for everyone. Okay, so I've already mentioned that um, negotiating is more, an offer is more than just about salary. So I've got this list here of things that are negotiable. So oftentimes an employer may include or not include relocation funds. A start date is also negotiable. I know many times students feel like they don't have the power to negotiate a start date, but it's actually quite normal. Salary is normal. So flex time and telecommuting is also, remote work is negotiable. Now, I, th I think we're in a whole new world here. Um, there are, we're clearly in a transition period. We're moving from completely remote work in some occupations and professions to perhaps having some combination of um, in-person presence. 
So as you ev evaluate offers, I think this is something to really ask about. What will the expectation be moving forward? Well, is there the option to completely work remotely or some type of hybrid arrangement? Uh, for those of you in the tech industry, and I know we have a few CS folks here, it's not uncommon for there to be stock options, bonuses, um, and those can be uh, quite a large percentage of the compensation package. That is also true in startups. So in tech companies and startups, by providing stock options, in some ways you're deferring some of your compensation until later because you're counting on the growth of, of those stocks. And bonuses are a nice thing too. Um, for those of you applying for academic positions, and I don't know if that's true, but there is the opportunity to negotiate some aspects of an academic job offer as well. And a lot of that has to do with startup packages in STEM. Uh, it also has to do with um, teaching load and teaching time and um, time to tenure. Okay, so those are quite the, that's quite the list. Um, I mentioned earlier about this notion of figuring out your, your take, your budget. But when you get a job offer, it's most likely going to be either an, it's going to be in an annual amount. And so I like to recommend that you go to this paycheck calculator or any other one, and you figure out what your take home pay is going to be. Because unlike when you're a graduate student, earning the salary that you're going to earn, you may be in a very different tax bracket. And you may be paying for part of your health insurance or all of your health insurance. Um, so it's very important for you to figure out what the take home pay is going to be once a month or twice a month or weekly. So doing the rough budget and then converting an annual salary into what you will be paid monthly so you can compare it to your budget is an important thing to do when you evaluate a job offer. Okay. I'm going to show you these steps, and then I'm going to uh, walk you through what each one means. And we actually have a little case study that you can look at as we're talking about each of these state steps. So we've, um, I've mentioned doing research initially. Once you apply somewhere and get a call for a screening interview, you should know what the salary ranges are for similar positions in similar industries. Second step, you need to figure out what your right salary range is for you, taking into account the data that you identify, the particular industry, the location, and then how you stack up, right? What your qualifications are. The third step is you're looking at that offer against your budget. The fourth step is you're gonna come up with a negotiating strategy. So you're gonna think through what you know about the industry, this offer, and then you're gonna come up with a proposal about what the salary should be. My recommendation is that you take care of salary first, and then you talk about other things. Now, step five is you're gonna practice. You're gonna practice getting comfortable saying the words. And there's lots of YouTube videos that show you phrases and words that you can use to practice. We're gonna, we're gonna do a little contrived scenario, but it's gonna be interesting just to be able to practice some of the words. You actually do the negotiation. Most of the time it will be handled verbally by phone or Zoom or Skype, whatever the employer wants to use. <clears throat> it might be, um, it's important that you're prepared and practiced before you start that. Because remember, the employer wants to get to the point where they generate one offer letter. They may send the offer um, in an email. And if that's the case, then you would start the negotiation by suggesting that you, that you talk by phone, that you have some questions about the salary range. And they'll take the cue that you, you're ready for a negotiation. The last part is that you get the revised offer in writing and then you respond in writing because you're either gonna accept the offer or you're gonna decline the offer, okay? 
Um, so I want you to go ahead and if you haven't done so, download that negotiating your job offer checklist. That I want you to just take a quick peek at that. This is something that you can use later. <clears throat> it walks you through these steps. This is in the folder of handouts. It asks you to think clearly about um, the position itself. You can go back to the previous handout and ask yourself, does this position stack up about the three things that you absolutely want to have? And is there anything in the offer that is something you absolutely don't want, that that's your walk away? It's a big red flag. So in Varun's case, if he got a job offer and it was 50% travel, that's a big red flag, right? He may have to decline that offer. Um, you'll notice it asks you to establish a salary range. And I'm gonna talk about that more in a moment. There's all kinds of data out there about salary ranges. I think that the art of it is really figuring out what the right salary range is for you and the particular position based on what that job is all about because job titles are not all equal. And then you're going to evaluate the offer and you're gonna ask yourself, what are the pros, what are the cons? Before you negotiate, you're gonna come up with some clarifying questions and then you're going to start um, the negotiation. So this is one roadmap for a negotiation. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause there just for a moment before I talk in more detail. And I want to ask Debbie if there's, are there any questions right now? You can put them in the chat box. No questions yet. Okay. So just to pause. So what we've, I've identified some things that you should do ahead of time. You should do some initial salary research about what the position types you're applying to pay. You should come up with a budget and you should definitely think about what's most important to you. Because when you accept an offer, you're really only accepting your next position. And sometimes the offer on the table is not ideal, but it's going to serve as a stepping stone <clears throat> based on some of the priorities that you have. So when you meet with a career center staff member, we'll walk through all of this with you. And and ultimately you'll be able to make a decision about whether to accept an offer or not and, and how you're going to proceed with a negotiation. So let me pause there for a moment. <clears throat> There's no questions, I'm going to move forward. Here's okay. a question. Okay. Do you recommend any sites for knowing the market range of your salary? Excellent. That was that person is clairvoyant. Lizzie, you are clairvoyant. That is my very next slide. Okay. So you should use multiple sources. And as a graduate student, you already know that when you read multiple sources of information, a lot of times I'm going like this with my hands, you have to put it together, you have to synthesize it. So the Occupational Outlook Handbook is a US Department of Labor publication and it has standard job titles and it shows you graphs of what the, for all the people working in that occupation, what their salary is. Now that in, will include new hires to seasoned people, but that's one source. In LinkedIn, you can use their salary tool. You can also go to indeed.com or Glassdoor Salary.com used to be one of my favorites, but they've put a lot of ads. But again, all of these sites will give you information based on users putting their salary information in. And sometimes the salary information provided could be based on five people, or it may be based on 45 people. So these are the standard places that you would start. In addition, professional associations do surveys. So for example, I was working with a student today who has an offer from an independent high school and he was able to find on their website a salary survey. So there are some national associations 
So for example, the American Association of University Professors does a very public survey of new hires in faculty roles. You can even look it up by institution. So in addition to those public websites and checking out professional associations, you, if you're leveraging your network and building relationships with alumni from your program or alumni in Terrapins Connect or on LinkedIn, it's very appropriate to go to individuals that you've, that you've talked with before or done an informational interview with and you've kept in contact to say, you know, I'm at the point where I'm thinking I'm gonna get a job offer. I've done my salary research and it looks like the salary range is pretty wide. I'm seeing 75 to $100,000. Could, could we chat briefly about typical salaries in this region and job titles? So there will be some alumni who would be willing to have that kind of conversation with you. And I would start with the alumni that are in Terrapins Connect. And you can look up the, the topics that those alumni are willing to chat with you about. Um, it's, this is just one more reason why having that network um, is important. And we have a question, Susan, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. from Arjun. Opportunities for international students are limited by their visa status in the US. How does one negotiate a scarce resource? Well, Arjun, that is a really good question. And I'm going to say it depends on your particular scenario. It's going to depend on your skill set and the types of jobs to which you're applying. It's going to depend on the types of employers that you're working with. And I would say, I hear your fear. I hear your fear and I hear that concern because um, you may or may not have um, you may or you may not have as many offers, but what's important to know is what a fair salary range is. And I would say having a conversation, an, ind an individual appointment with a career advisor in your primary career center about doing salary research and also understanding what international alumni from your program are doing. They're, so I'm thinking about engineering career services. They have uh, data about new graduates and they may be able to tell you that someone that went and worked for Intel, this is what their starting salary was. They won't tell you who the person was, but I think there's enough data sources that you can get a sense of what the salary is. And it, again, depending on what types of positions you're applying for, um, there may or may not be more um, opportunities for you to negotiate, but you should, you still should negotiate. The other thing I want to say is um, if you're applying to larger global corporations, they're going to expect you to negotiate. If you're applying to smaller regional companies, if you are able to present them with a clear outline of the value that you add, and what the typical salaries are, um, you in most cases will be offered a fair salary. But if you've done the research, you'll know that it's not a fair salary and, and you can determine whether or not um, it's something that you wanna move forward with. Go back to that priority list. So if someone's primary goal is to obtain an OPT position and you have one offer on the table and it, it has two of your musts haves and it doesn't have any deal breakers, but it's not your ideal, you, you may want to entertain it. So I would encourage all students and especially international students to have a conversation with a career advisor. Um, I know H1B sponsorship is the ultimate goal, but in many cases, there may be some steps that are going to lead you to that, starting with perhaps an internship, a first position, which may or may not be your ideal. And then if you're in a STEM field, you may have the opportunity to even um, switch OPT positions and land an opportunity where sponsorship could happen down the road. But 
But those are all very individualized questions that I really would encourage an individual appointment with. It's a great question. It's not a black and white answer. And I would say it's not always scarce. It just depends. Great question. Thank you for asking it. OK. Um, when you're doing your salary research, it's really important on these sites that you read what the responsibilities are, because not all job titles are created equally. And the same position in a different industry can be a very different salary range. So for example, a, I can tell you a data analyst working in higher education, for example, in an institutional research setting, is going to have a lower salary than someone doing data analytics for one of the big financial firms. So it's really important that you synthesize the data that you gather from these different public web websites, from your conversations and informational interviews, and from any other salary sur surveys that may have been done by an industry association or a, a other professional association. Okay. Now, how do you figure out your target salary? All right. So when you look at these, I'm going to pull up my other, um, I'm going to pull up the other example. So I have a handout. Ooh, wait a minute. Okay. So in the folder, there is a handout. Come on, internet. You're welcome, Arjun. I, I think that was a fantastic question. I know it's on the minds of all of our international students. Um, salary negotiation worksheet. It looks like this. So we have about 10 minutes left. I want to share with you, this is a case study. So you can go back and you can read it very carefully. But when you, when you look at any of these websites or the Bureau of Labor Statistics, you are typically going to see a bell curve. And it's going to, most of these sites let you put in locations, size of the company, if you supervise people, years of experience. So I would gather that metadata first. And I would try to figure out where you lie below or above the median. So, um, and in most cases, so I picked a job out of careers for Terps and in red are the steps that you would, would follow. So the way you figure out your salary range is um, based on your own qualifications, we're saying that the salary range for this job is between uh, 5,100 and 65, I'm sorry, 51,000 and 65,000. And you meet most of the requirements. So we're saying that, yeah, you're gonna be just a little bit below, sort of right in the middle. And then you figure out what is 5%, 10% and 15% more. Because when you start the negotiation, you're not gonna start with where you want to land. And in this case, you would wanna land around $55,000. So we're going to add, we're gonna add 10% to that range. So the range was 51 to 65. So we're gonna say the negotiation range is anywhere between 56 and 70, okay? And I've, uh, for the sake of the example, I went to the salary calculator and figured out what the targeted monthly payment uh, is gonna be for that salary. And we figured out based on the budget that this person, this hypothetical person cannot accept a salary less than $50,000. Now we're gonna factor in benefits. And some of you know already that some companies will only pay a portion of the health benefits but it's usually before taxes. So whatever the portion of the health benefits that they're paying, you can add that onto the salary because if the employer wasn't paying it, it would be coming completely out of your salary. Um, this employer in this example is paying about $500 a month for health insurance. They're gonna provide $1,000 of professional development and they're gonna give a Metro pass. 
So in some metropolitan places where you would be expected to be in the office, the employer may also pay for parking. And like in New York City, that could be, <laughs> that could be $800 a month. Okay, so this, this example shows how, based on the job description, looking in salary.com, sort of figuring out, well, I'm not at the top of the range, I'm not at the bottom, I'm gonna, I really would love to be paid $55,000 for this job. And so when I negotiate, I'm going to negotiate for the upper 50s. Okay. Now, some of you may need to go back and read this. But I what I want to do is I actually, I'm going to um, put you in pairs. I'm hoping everyone is still with us. Actually, I'm going to put you in groups of three. I'm going to use breakout rooms, and I'm going to give you five minutes to just read through this script. I want you to practice saying the words. This is a very contrived negotiation. So I'm going to put you in a group of three. Two people are going to play. One is going to be the employer, the employee, the person being offered the job, and the other one is going to be the human resources person. And I just want you to read it go through it once. And then I just want you to share your impressions with your fellow group members. All righty. So hopefully one person will have downloaded this worksheet. I'm going to stop sharing. Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to ask the universe that enough people are paying attention to participate in this little, little breakout activity. But Debbie, you're going to have to do it unless you make me the host. Do you want to make me the host for a moment? I'm making you the host. Okay. There we Let go. See. All right, you're the host. Okay. So let's see if I can do these breakout rooms. All right. We've got 14 people. I do not, well, Jennifer, Jenny Susan. and Debbie, yeah. Excuse me, Susan, what yeah. is the name of the worksheet um, folks need to know? Okay. There's a list well, of five. Which one is it? Well, you know what? Let me tell you the name and then I'm going to change. May I change my mind? I just looked at the clock. Yeah. Maybe, maybe there's a volunteer who will do this with me. I'll be HR and you be the employee. Is there someone who would be willing to role play with me? Is there anyone who would? be willing to role play with me. No, no takers, huh? I can, I can role play with you. Thank, Lee, thank you. Oh, I have two Ashley. Ashley, <laughs> how about, um, okay, I was Ashley, if the other Ashley wants to, that's fine too. Ashley Veneman, since you are unmiked, you are, you are my person who's going to get the job offer. Sounds great. Do you have the handout or do I yes. need to put it in the chat? Okay. Nope, I have it. Okay. All right. So you are the employee and we're assuming that I've already sent you an email saying I'm offering you this job for 50,200, but you want somewhere around 55 to 56. So we've set up the meeting and now you're calling me and you're going to start the conversation. Great. Um, Hello, thank you for setting up this meeting to talk with me today. I am so, I'm sorry, I'm not very actor, so I don't know the, the That's okay. tone here, but um, I'm so excited by your offer for the research analyst position and joining the American Beverage Association. I've had a chance to review the details of the offer. Ashley, we think that you're an excellent candidate for the position and a great fit. And um, we hope that you're gonna accept our offer of 50,200 plus benefits. And if you're ready to accept that, I can uh, send you the final contract today. Um, thank you. I am confident that I will be able to do an excellent job based on the duties we have discussed in the interview. However, according to my research, the market rate for someone in the position is closer to 50,000, somewhere in the range of 56,000 to 70,000. Would you consider a starting salary offer in that range? Hmm. 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 The position is budgeted at a maximum of 60,000. 
And most of your experience has been in the academic setting. Um, we know that you're going to be able to do a great job, but this is going to be the first time that you've worked in industry. Um, and you know what? It's a great place to work and we have super benefits. So we, I really feel like, we feel like the, that it's a really fair offer. Um, I can appreciate that. However, my experience summarizing scientific research is going to benefit ABA and we're going to be able to reach the members so effectively and so quickly. We won't have to deal with any learning curve related to writing scientific summaries. I hope that we can come together to a starting salary that reflects my qualifications and my qualifications and how that will benefit ABA's goals for the new database. Hmm. Yes, um, you are definitely right. You are a great fit. Um, I did have a chance to talk with the hiring manager and the best that we can offer you based on uh, what the position is and our budgets at this time is 56,500. Um, I, I would probably say like, thank you. That's more in line with um, the market rate for someone in this position. Um, I'm also interested in discussing the benefits package. Super. I'm, I, you know that we all, all, we offer all of our employees a standard set of health and retirement benefits. Um, did you have any questions about that benefit package? Um, I did not see any professional development included in the offer. Um, I'm really interested in taking some skills-based trainings each year that will increase my value to the um, American Beverage Association. Super. Well, we, you know, I'm glad to hear you're interested in professional development. We want all of our employees to continue adding new skills. And that really ultimately benefits us and increases their productivity. So we can offer you $500 annually. And of course, you would need to discuss and work out um, prior approval for attending conferences with your manager. Great. Thank you. That sounds like a very generous offer. Would you be willing to send me that in writing later today so that I can respond with an answer by the end of the week? Absolutely, Ashley. I'm so glad that we were able to answer all of your questions and I look forward to getting that contract back from you by Friday at the latest. Okay, thank you. Can thank I ask you. a follow-up question? Of course. So, I mean, I'm not sure in this fake scenario what day of the week it was and yep. so how far away the end of the week is. Mm -hmm. Is that standard? Or if like, if someone sends me a contract that day and we've already negotiated, like, would they expect me to return that quicker than end of the week, depending on what day of the week it was? Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point. I would say once you come to agreement and they send you the contract, um, they usually will tell you when to return it. Now, if let's say you had some other, um, if you had some additional questions, you might then follow up before you sign it. But I would say it's not unusual. 24, 48 hours is very, very customary, especially since you've already agreed to terms. You shouldn't finish the negotiation until you've had all your questions answered. So, we didn't do it in this role play, but if you had questions, you, you might want to ask all of those questions before you would even um, talk about what the salary was. So in this role play, you went right to salary, but if you had other questions, you might in this phone conversation just have those questions answered. And then you would say, okay, now that I have these questions answered, I will get back to you, um, you know, with, some, with, with my thoughts about the offer. Okay, so not everyone is ready to negotiate right away, but always, if they don't tell you when, always ask that clarifying question. Super. So I'm curious if there are questions from about anything. Ashley, thank you. I'm curious if there are questions. I know we went quickly. I tried to give you handouts that you could use later and you can reread through this scenario. But now's a great time to ask anything that we haven't discussed. All right, there are no questions right now, but we'll, we'll be patient and give everyone a minute. Oh, it looks like we have something. The sponsorship part of benefits. Yes, and that's the end mm. of the beginning is in a hypothetical situation, if someone has multiple offers in some interval of time. So do you accept and then reject later on if someone gets a new offer in a month? 
okay. is sponsorship part of the benefits? Yeah. Oh, that's uh, a separate question. I'm sorry. Um, I do not believe it's part of the benefits. I think it's part of the scenario, right? That they're willing to apply for you, right? Debbie, um, when Zach and others have done the H-1B workshop, is there a lawyer answer that I'm unaware of? Since I am not a lawyer, I am unable to answer that question. I, I am too, right? So, I, <laughs> so let me tell you how I answer it from the employment point of view. Um, let's, let's talk about multiple offers. You do not have an offer until you have a verbal offer or a written offer. You don't have an offer. So you might be somewhere in the application process. So I will have students come to me and say, I have this offer and I put in an application here and then I'll say, well, have you had an interview yet? And they'll say no. And I'm like, well, you don't have a job offer from that one. So you do not, you do not have multiple offers on the table until you have verbal and or written offers that have come through email, right? Now, if you get them at the same time, um, you need to evaluate them against, is this what I want? Is it not what I want? And then if you do not have an offer from someone, it's very appropriate to go and let the other employer that you had an interview with already, or that perhaps you had a screening interview with, it's okay to go to them and ask where you are in the process. And it's okay to let them know that you have received a job offer. Most employers who give you an offer will give you a week. If you, if you ask for more than a week, they will think that you are um, using job offers to kind of engage in that arms race of salary. And so I would say you have to evaluate what you have on the table. If you're already far down the application process with another employer, let's say you've had a second interview, it's okay to go back and ask them, where, you know, where are you in the, pro where are they in the process that you have another offer, but they may not answer you. They may not tell you. Um, I, I think that you have to have conversations as if you were going to work for these individuals and you also have to have some integrity. Okay. So if now I see Hazim is asking about tenure track positions. And right. Postdocs, so postdocs are a different animal. Postdocs are totally different. Most postdoc salaries are fixed because they're paid for by research funds. Um, there may or may not be um, re, uh, relocation salaries. But what you can do is most universities or other uh, agencies have postdoc handbooks. They're available usually online, and you should be leveraging your network to um, understand what the postdoc pay range is. And, and Hazim, also for you, depending on where the postdoc is, if it's at a university, if it's at NIH, that, you know, again, these are great questions for uh, individuals. There's not as much, um, there's not as much negotiation latitude because postdoc salaries are pretty standard. And they, but they do vary by field, I will say that. Great question. Um, I want to go back to the question about um, is sponsorship part of the benefits? I'm going to find out the correct answer about that, but I like to think about it as OPT is a benefit with your F1 visa. It is an opportunity for an employer, for you to get to know an employer, add value, and also do good work and gain experience. Um, it does cost employers to apply for that. Um, I do not believe students should be paying for that, but I would, I would think about the sponsorship as just one of the things that comes along with that particular opportunity. So sometimes individuals entertain working for a particular company because of the kind of experience that they'll gain or they might accept a postdoc because they get to work with a certain person. There are internationals who accept employment with certain companies because they have a, a higher percentage or they, they submit a large number of um, sponsorship applications annually. So again, these are all very nuanced questions that you really 
absolutely need to talk with an immigration attorney about, and also in terms of evaluating your particular scenario, if you're an international student, talk with a career counselor. And I know we're out of time. We are, and I wanna be respectful of your yep. time. And everyone else's. Exactly. Thank you so much, Susan, for coming back again and doing another grad alting workshop. You always provide like really practical, thought provoking um, information. The role playing exercise is excellent. And you were just a great support to our students. So thank you again for joining us today. I'm very welcome. And I really want to encourage, I've said this four times, if you are an international student, begin to work with your career services office. If, if you're not an international student, work with the career services office. We're here to serve you. And um, there are options, there are always options and we're here to help you. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you, Jennifer. Attend the grad student um, week. There's lots of good, good yeah. things happening. And, and we have a raffle. Woohoo! <laughs> exactly. All right, Jen, I see you're there with me. So we are going to select a few raffle winners. So thank you for those who could stay until the end of the workshop because you need to be present to win. So Jen has uh, used, uh, I don't know what you've used to pick the winners. I put all the names in random.org and then it shuffles up the names and then the top three who are in attendance win a prize. So we are picking three winners today, um, Ashley, Judah, and Ahmed. So I put your full names into the chat. Um, Debbie will be emailing you with directions on how to pick up uh, your swag bags. They're really awesome. They're things from both GLAO and GSL, so we can't wait to share those with you. Yeah. Thanks, Jen, for um, being my co-host and for organizing the, uh, the raffle. Thanks to everyone for being terrific grad students at the University of Maryland. We are blessed to, uh, to be together today and to have made it through this past year. So happy Grad Student Appreciation Week. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. You're welcome. Have a nice one. Bye. <laughs> you too. Bye-bye. Go out and negotiate. That's right. Yes. <laughs> Y'all make the money. money. Yes. <laughs> Cha <-ching. laughs> Have a nice one. That's right. Bye. You too, Judah. Bye, Judah. Oh, my gosh. Uh, awesome. Are you going to stop the recording? Mm-hmm. Um, you have to stop it, Susan, because you're oh, the host. <laughs> I do. There you go. Thank you.